the Ermine Street Guard. Standard bearers and the horn player, and in front of them, the Centurion, who commands the sentry or company of soldiers. Behind the standard bearers march legionary infantry, the citizen soldiers of the Empire. Behind the legionaries are two Roman ladies, one of whom is probably married to the Centurion at this time. And behind them, you have the auxiliary soldiers, the non-citizen soldiers of the Empire, who by serving 25 years could become citizens. At the head of the auxiliaries marches a very important gentleman, he carries the image of the Emperor on a pole, the e Magnifa, and this is how soldiers at the time knew what the Emperor looked like, because of course there weren't any photographs or anything like that, only coins. So this was a way of making sure the soldiers remained loyal, because the soldiers would salute the image of the Emperor if he couldn't be there in person, which is very likely because he'd be off in Rome. The legionary column, uh, column swings round, you can see how the light glints off the armour, all beautifully polished, it's not polished just to make it look pretty, but to stop it from rusting, because at this time, of course, there's no rust proofing, and the only way to stop the armour from rusting and falling to bits is to keep polishing it. It's hard work, and indeed these members of the Army Street Guard have spent many hours polishing the stuff before this display, and will do so afterwards again. Now the column comes to a halt, and in a minute you will have an opportunity to see at close range the soldiers of the Empire, if you're a bit further down the tape, don't worry, because soldiers will march down to you, so you'll be able to have a look at them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's second display by the Ermine Street Guard. The Society was formed some 21 years ago, in 1972, with the aim of researching into the Roman Imperial Army and reconstructing its armour and equipment. And about 95% of the equipment you see on display in front of you is actually made by the members of the society. <coughs> the Romans successfully invaded Britain in 43 AD, in the, uh, the middle of the first century AD, and the uniforms and equipment which you see in front of you date from that period, and it shows the sort of equipment which the soldiers would have worn at the time when the base, which later became Roxeter, was established as the army moved northwards on its conquest of Britain. Now the basic building block of a Roman army was the Roman legion, and an army would be comprised of legionary units supported by auxiliary units, and the soldiers would be about equal in numbers to compose the army. We've got both sorts of soldiers on display today. for the Ermine Street Guard. Standard bearers and the horn player, and in front of them, the Centurion, who commands the sentry or company of soldiers. Behind the standard bearers march legionary infantry, the citizen soldiers of the Empire. Behind the legionaries are two Roman ladies, one of whom is probably married to the Centurion at this time. And behind them, you have the auxiliary soldiers, the non-citizen soldiers of the Empire, who by serving 25 years could become citizens. At the head of the auxiliaries marches a very important gentleman. He carries the image of the Emperor on a pole, the e Magnifa, and this is how soldiers at the time knew what the Emperor looked like, because of course there weren't any photographs or anything like that, only coins. So this was a way of making sure the soldiers remained loyal, because the soldiers would salute the image of the Emperor if he couldn't be there in person, which is very likely because he'd be off in Rome. The legionary column, uh, column swings round, you can see how the light glints off the armour, all beautifully polished. It's not polished just to make it look pretty, but to stop it from rusting, because at this time, of course, there's no rust proofing, and the only way to stop the armour from rusting and falling to bits is to keep polishing it. It's hard work, and indeed these members of the Army Street Guard have spent many hours polishing the stuff before this display, and will do so afterwards again. Now the column comes to a halt, and in a minute, you will have an opportunity to see at close range the soldiers of the Empire. 
If you're a bit further down the tape, don't worry, because soldiers will march down to you, so you'll be able to have a look at them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's second display by the Emin Street Guard. The society was formed some 21 years ago, in 1972, with the aim of researching into the Roman Imperial Army and reconstructing its armour and equipment. And about 95% of the equipment you see on display in front of you is actually made by the members of the society. <coughs> the Romans successfully invaded Britain in 43 AD, in the, uh, the middle of the first century AD, and the uniforms and equipment which you see in front of you date from that period. And it shows the sort of equipment which the soldiers would have worn at the time when the base, which later became Roxeter, was established as the army moved northwards on its conquest of Britain. Now the basic building block of a Roman army was the Roman legion, and an army would be comprised of legionary units supported by auxiliary units, and the soldiers would be about equal in numbers to compose the army. And we've got both sorts of soldiers on display today, and we're going to start off by telling you a little bit about them. A legion would be made up of 5,300 men, in its organisation, it would be broken down into cohorts, ten cohorts. Each cohort would be broken down into centuries, and each century would be made up of 80 men at this time. Not 100, but 80. And the basic building block of the century is the legionary soldier. And if we take a closer look at the legionary soldiers, we'll explain a little bit about them. These men joined the army for a period of 25 years. They were not allowed to get married whilst they were in the army, and if they were married when they enlisted, the process of enlistment was an automatic form of divorce. So, gentlemen, now's your chance. Come and join the guard. <laughs> the reason for this was to try and make the army mobile, to make sure that it didn't become too attached to one particular part of the country, and if you needed to move it in a hurry, you didn't have the problem of relocating the uh, families as well. Didn't always work in practice, but that was the idea. The soldiers had to be citizens to join the legions, and as I've already said, they were in for a period of 25 years. If we start by looking at the armour and equipment the men wear, starting with the helmet, a large iron helmet, though in some cases it's made of bronze, as you'll see, gives good protection to the head, particularly with a large neck guard and large cheek pieces, and at the front of the helmet is a brow band to stop sword cuts coming from above. A Gallic helmet made of iron, with a large neck guard and cheek pieces, and a brow band at the front, which gives protection against sword cuts coming down from above. All of this armour was designed to protect them against the sort of peoples they were fighting against in Europe, and in Britain it was no different from the rest of Europe because Britain was occupied by Celtic. That the, uh, the enemy that the Romans were fighting throughout northern Europe, and particularly in Britain, were Celtic peoples. And their main weapon was a long slashing sword, which they would use to bring down overhead to smash down to, um, to their opponent. So all this armour is designed to protect the soldiers from that sort of blow. The body armour is called Lorica Segmentata. It's made up of strips of metal, strips of iron, which are joined internally by leather straps, and the metal plates are riveted to the leather straps. It means the armour is very flexible, it means the soldiers can move about whilst they're wearing it, and that's very important in enemy territory when you're building roads or fortifications and you need to keep your armour on. Around the waist is worn a military belt called a kingulum. That's a leather belt with metal plates attached to it. And at the front you'll see there's an apron, which is possibly for the protection of the lower stomach and private parts. However, that protection is more likely to be psychological than practical. It's also quite decorative. The armour is worn over a woolen tunic. There's a woolen scarf to protect the neck from the armour chaffing against it. And on his feet, you'll see a soldier wears a pair of leather boots called Caligai, and in the soles are numerous hobnails, up to 80 hobnails, which protect the leather and also give you a good firm grip when marching on grass. Finally, as a protection, each soldier carries a scutum or shield. This is made of strips of wood glued in differing directions. Nowadays, we'd call it plywood. On the face of which is linen, linen or leather, onto which is painted a design to show the legion from which the soldiers have come. There's a single hand grip, and the hand is protected by the metal boss at the front. When going into battle, the soldiers would first of all throw their peeler, or javelins, these seven-foot-long wood and metal javelins, 
The top third is made of metal, there's a hard tip and a soft iron shank. And obviously when you threw it, you would hope that it would hit an enemy and kill or disable him. But if it hit the ground or an enemy's shield, it would bend. The metal would bend, which means that the enemy couldn't pick them up and throw them straight back. And we know from Julius Caesar's account of fighting the Gauls that it was possible for one pelum to pin two shields together if the enemy were fighting with their shields overlapping. As soon as the peeler have been thrown, the soldiers pull out their gladius, the short thrusting sword, and rush forward using the cover of the shield to actually engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with their enemy. And the idea isn't to have a fencing match like in a Hollywood film. The idea is to stab at your opponent and kill him or disable him as quickly as you can and move on to the next one. It's a very mechanical, very methodical way of fighting. And finally, for that desperate last resort, the each soldier carries a pugio or dagger, a small, smaller version of the sword, which could possibly be used for jobs around the camp as well as to fight with as a last resort. So that's the legionary soldier. His equivalent in the auxiliary units was the auxiliary soldier. These men were not Roman citizens, usually, though they could be. But normally these were men from conquered or allied provinces who would join the army and often bring particular skills or expertise which was going to help the Roman army. These men were organised into smaller units, either 480 or 1,000 strong. If you look at the equipment, you'll see that there's once again a helmet, in this case made of bronze, of simpler design than the legionaries, a male shirt made up of thousands of individual metal links. You'll be able to see these close up later on. Once again, a sword and dagger, though this time usually worn on one or more commonly two belts, a flat oval shield, more suitable for skirmishing, and a haster, or thrusting spear, which could be thrown, but is more likely to have been used in an overarm fashion hand-to-hand -hand fighting. These men would join the army for a period of 25 years and at the end of that service they would get Roman citizenship which could be passed on to their families and that made the the peoples of a particular area feel Roman rather than conquered. Now the auxilia also provided all the specialist troops for the Roman army. The strength of the legions was in there. Now the Roman army didn't have a very good tradition of uh, cavalry. Um, most of the soldiers in the Roman army at this time were not Roman or even Italian. But nevertheless, Italy wasn't a very good recruiting ground for cavalry. And the Celtic peoples, who they were spending so much time fighting against, were the best horsemen, and so nearly all Roman cavalry were recruited from Celtic peoples. We'll take a look at the equipment of the two riders. Starting with the soldiers themselves, you'll see that each wears body armour. In one case it's a male shirt with a large cape to protect the shoulders. In the other case it's a scale armour shirt which is made up of hundreds of individual metal scales which overlap each other rather like a fisher's scales. You'll see the helmets are very elaborate and you'll see from the whole look of the soldiers that they're very expensive to equip and to keep in the field. Each soldier wears short trousers or brachii along with the conventional boots and each carries a longer sort of sword than the infantry, called a spartha. Looking at the hand weapons, there is the haster, as with the infantry, and a flat oval shield, slightly narrower than the infantry. If we look at the horses, you'll see that they're very elaborately decorated in their harness, and a lot of this serves no practical purpose, other than to make the soldiers look expensive and to look very glamorous. You'll see also there are no stirrups. Roman soldiers, Roman cavalry, didn't need stirrups. This did not in any way impair their ability to fight, and that's partly because of the type of saddle that they used. If you look at the saddles, you'll see that each saddle has at its corner um, a sort of a wooden peg or stump, and these horns actually form um, corner anchor points against which the men can uh, gain their purchase and stability whilst in the saddle, and you'll see that demonstrated later on. So that basically is the lineup of private soldiers which were available in the army. Lineup of private soldiers which were available in the army. But each unit, whether it was legionary, auxiliary or cavalry, would have officers. And we're going to show you now some of the officers which would be present in every century of the army. Starting off with the signifer, who carries a signum or standard. The symbols on which possibly show the cohort from which he's come. 
You'll see he's wearing, once again, scale armor, as with one of the cavalrymen. But in this case, the scales are smaller, and there are more of them, and they're made of bronze. He wears a helmet, as with the legionaries, as well as a sword and a dagger. And over his helmet, he wears an animal skin, in this case, a European brown bear. All Roman musicians and standard bearers wore animal skins over their helmets. We're not sure of the significance. The reason hasn't been uh, passed down to us. The Romans didn't write it down in the way which survived. But it obviously makes the standard bearer look more imposing and possibly has some religious significance as well. Next we have the cornucan, who carries this cornu, a large circular horn, used to give commands on the, bat on the battlefield, on the march and in the camp. He wears a mail shirt with shoulder pieces to once again give that protection from downward sword cuts. A helmet, sword and dagger, and over his helmet you'll see he wears an animal skin and this is a wolf skin. And remember the story of Romulus and Remus and how they were brought up by the wolf, the she-wolf, and so the wolf is a sacred animal of the Romans. Next we have a Vexillarius who carries a Vexillum, a flag type standard. And if a detachment from a legion was sent off on some duty, either locally or elsewhere in the empire, they would take the vexillum with them to show the legion from which they'd been detached. This vexillum has on it the uh, symbol of the charging ball, which is the symbol of the 20th legion, and the 20th legion was based here at Roxeter for some time on its move north before it became permanently based at Chester. Dressed very much as the corner can, once again with the wolf skin, the sword, the dagger, the male shirt. I'm dressed as an imagnifer, and my job is to carry the image of the Emperor, in this case the Emperor Vespasian, and you'll see it being carried aloft by one of the auxiliaries. I'm wearing a male shirt, an uh, animal skin, once again a bear skin, and the purpose of the image was partly religious, because the Roman state religion required Emperor worship, but also it was symbolic and a way of the Emperor being with the troops, in spirit if not in body, and it was also a way by which the soldiers and conquered peoples could see what the emperor looked like in an age before television, postage stamps and newspapers. And just out of interest, even though it looks a bit impractical, cavalry units also had imagos. Second in command of a century would be the Optio. He's chosen by the centurion to be the centurion's replacement, hence the term. It's his centurion's option. If the centurion should be injured or killed in battle, the Optio is automatically there to take over. Our Optio is dressed as a legionary, but with more elaborate equipment. You'll see he's got a crest on his helmet. You'll see that uh, he's carrying a wooden staff with a silver knob on the end, which is partly a badge of rank, but it also gives him a longer reach so he can tap on the heads of soldiers in front who are perhaps out of step. On his finger he wears a ring, and on his hip, in a small satchel, he has a wax tablet on which would be carried the orders of the day and the passwords. In command of the century is a centurion, and as you'll see, his equipment is very different from that of the other soldiers. Starting with the helmet, he wears a horsehair crest, which goes from side to side, and it means it's very easy to pick him out in a hurry, should you wish to get clarification or orders from him. On his body, he wears a short male shirt over a leather arming doublet, on his shins, he wears a pair of greaves. These are made of bronze, which have been silvered. And whilst these would give some protection, they're actually worn as a badge of rank, because they're very impractical to wear, and uh, can at times be quite difficult to wear because of the way in which they actually interfere with walking, and particularly running. You'll see a few other badges of rank, the cloak on the shoulder, and also the vine staff, which is carried as a badge of rank but can also be used to administer casual corporal punishment. And if anyone's not sure of that... On joining the army, the soldier would embark on a four-month-long period of training to give him the basic skills and abilities which he would need to become an effective soldier. We know from Roman records that there were height requirements and general fitness requirements for the other troops as well. On joining the army, the soldier would embark on a four-month training program to teach him the basic skills which would be needed for survival, both of himself and his unit. We know from Roman records that they favoured recruits from an agricultural or country background, 
people who lived and been brought up in towns tended to be a bit softer and perhaps uh, less less hardy and arduous than those from the country. You'll see various activities going on here. There's uh, soldiers fighting with wooden swords and wicker shields. These were sometimes made to be power, um, heavier than the, the actual weapons, so that the soldiers got used to fighting with things which were much more heavy than the real thing, and therefore it was easier to use real swords and shields after you trained on these. The auxiliaries are fighting with uh, wicker shields and practice faster. And you'll see also soldiers practicing throwing the peeler by throwing just ordinary wooden shafts. Because, of course, it's not just a case of learning the technique of, say, throwing a javelin. You've got to do it with the armor on as well. There are also three recruits who are going through the basic square bashing, learning the basic drill which will allow them to move as a body rather than as individual soldiers. So that's the sort of thing which the infantry would, would train with. A pair over in the corner. I think, sorry to break up. I oh, know I'll take this a stage further by showing you the way in which the cavalry might have trained and showing how you actually work up from the basic practice stages through to something a bit more realistic. Now we've set up two targets for our horsemen and they'll probably start off by actually approaching these with their lances. And as you see our two impressive Cavalrymen and riding around, just try and imagine what a thousand of them would look like and sound like. The Latin for a cavalry unit is ala, and ala means wings, because the cavalry units will be positioned on the flanks of the army in a battle to protect the edges, rather like wings, but because of their speed and flexibility, they were available to exploit any particular opportunity which came up. And the real opportunity for cavalry was breaking into and pursuing a beaten enemy. When you're on the run, any concern of protecting yourself as a unit goes, you tend to fight and survive as an individual, and that's no way to actually resist this sort of impact coming up behind you. Now remember all the books that say you can't ride like this without stirrups, it's rubbish. See also how the shield protects the man right down from his neck to his ankle. concerns when reconstructing this was whether the straps which go around the horse's rear would be a liability or a problem but the value of practical reconstruction like this is to try these things out and in fact it seems to cause them no problem at all. So now they've exchanged their weapons for the swords but they're actually using the practice swords as would the, the infantry as you saw when they were practicing and you'll see that these longer swords give them a better reach from the horseback position. is that the horses you've got in front of you, splendid as they are, are not Roman war horses, and we are in fact training them. So the sort of thing you see now is what you would have seen in a Roman cavalry fort, as the horses were schooled as well as the men. We're asking them to do unnatural things. And 
And when you look at Roman harness, and particularly the bits and the spurs that were used, it was fairly brutal. You have a fast accelerator to spur the horse forward, and then a sudden sharp break in the mouth in the form of a, a curved bit. It's very frustrating for the man on foot because we're trying to teach the horse not to be scared of attacking the man on the ground. And so the man on the ground, literally at the moment, has got to constrain himself and be careful not to fight back until the horse is really ready for it. So, having got the uh, mastery of the sword, it's time now to practice with the lance. take a dive. <laughs> Just as well I bet on that one. So, having learned the basics as an individual, and having learned the basics of how to march and fight as a body, the recruit is able to go forward and join his legion or his auxiliary cohort and go on campaign and possibly, perhaps not too often, but very possibly, into battle. And we'll now show you some of the battle tactics which were used by the Roman army to make it so successful. So the Magnifer rejoins the Legionary and Auxiliary troops, and we'll see some of the battle tactics that he was telling you about. Now we have to put this in context. Remember, the enemies they're fighting most of the time, at least, when they're having a civil war against each other, which did happen, sadly, for the Romans, most enemies were Celtic people who had a completely different culture to that of the Romans, and that went as far as fighting. The Celts were very much a sort of heroic society where the warriors would be terrifically interested in personal glory and unwilling to accept discipline. And so an army of Celts was really an army of individuals. Furthermore, a lot of the Celts wouldn't be particularly heavy armoured. Uh, they'd have a shield perhaps uh, a helmet, if they were very well off they'd have a male shirt, but most of them would fight virtually naked with not much protection except the shield. And with those javelins coming over in volleys, a lot of the shields would be rendered useless, and so you'd have a, the front ranks of the Celts would be standing there with not much to defend themselves. Remember, they're fighting as individuals, all they can do on mass is attack or run away. They don't want to run away, so they're going to have to fight and stand their ground. Uh, but they're up against something they've got no concept of at all, a disciplined, well-organized and trained force. So quite often a small force of Romans, or certainly a lot smaller than the Celtic force, could beat a very large number of, of, of warriors. And this is exactly what happened to Queen Boudicca's army in the final battle after the Boudiccan revolt. Just 10,000 men of the Roman army routed and almost massacred up to 100,000 Celtic tribesmen in the final battle. And it's simply because of, of superior discipline and tactical training um, added, of course, to the superb armour of the Roman soldiers. And they can't throw the javelins, of course, because we've said earlier that they would bend and we'd have to hammer them back again. So they're putting them down, and instead coming out with the stabbing gladius. Gladius is, of course, where the word gladiator comes from. Although these soldiers can't be confused with gladiators, which were very much a sort of spectator sport, somewhat tasteless in Rome at the time. First of all, though, before the heavy infantry of the legionaries come in, the auxiliaries would probably be sent in. Very highly trained, quite capable of winning battles on their own to their discipline. Indeed, in the battle against the Caledonians, I think in AD 69, they actually beat the Caledonians.
Caledonians while the legionaries stood in reserve. So imagine a large cohort of auxiliaries coming forward, each of them with a stabbing Hasta, protected by the shield. Again with that discipline which could be very unnerving to the Celts. The auxiliary cavalry hovering on the wings to uh, protect the flanks of the soldiers. Now let's just assume that the auxiliaries haven't succeeded in breaking through. The legionaries come forward. They're in a checkerboard formation so each soldier can use his sword and shield. The shield can be used offensively to punch into the face of an enemy or to catch him under the chin with the top edge. And one stab in the right place can render the Celt dead or seriously wounded. These swords are used like bayonets. They're not um, cutting and slashing swords. As you can imagine, without a double tape barrier, this would be a little more intimidating. The Celts, of course, um, no doubt would have loved to put a double barrier up if they could. As you can see, the soldiers march, march in um, step very carefully. The Optio on the left-hand side there shouting Syndex, Syndex, and watching the dressing. And round come the soldiers, with the swords going back into the scabbards. And now we'll see one of the most famous of Roman military tactics, the Testudo or Tultus. Now, this is not a battlefield manoeuvre as such. It's used in sieges, and the idea is to get engineers up to an enemy gate or wall so they can chip away at the gate or wall, knock it down, and send the assault troops in. So the soldiers put their shields on top of their heads and in front of their bodies. We know they put them on the sides as well, but we haven't quite worked out how, because you run out of arms. But it did happen. And the idea is you march up to the gates or the walls in this formation while the enemy rain down all sorts of missiles on top of, you know, stones, missiles, um, spears, rolled up copy of the Radio Times, I don't know, anything really. And it all bounces off. The only effective defence of this is boiling oil and the Celts didn't have it, although in Jerusalem the siege there was very nasty for some Romans with boiling oil got right inside the shields and inside the armour. Horrible. So they get up to the gates in this formation while all the missiles bounce off and then the engineers climb underneath the legion on his legs and use them as a mobile shelter from the enemy uh, stones. That's quite difficult to do because you have to be very careful that you don't step on the soldier in front. It's a close formation, so it takes a lot of training. If you do step on the foot of the man in front, he's like to drop his shield and then you're in big trouble. Now then, march back nice and easily and I would ask those ladies and gentlemen who are directly in front of the Roman soldiers to stand up as you're about to find out what it's like to be a Celtic army. So if you could stand, it should be just a, a safety precaution, but if you could stand up, if you're in front of the Romans when they turn around, that would be a good idea. You're going to see a um, maneuver called the wedge or arrowhead formation, which is still used by riot police today. It's very effective. <laughs> Ah, right, we've got the power back. Hooray. Right, the wedge formation. We have the shields being banged to intimidate the enemy. They'll come forward, first of all, at a walk, and then at a charge. And the arrowhead formation is very easy um, to penetrate an enemy force because you psychologically move away from the point of attack. Because everybody tries to get away from that leaning edge as it comes in. So the point of the Roman wedge is the point to avoid. So if you're a Celt, you try to back away to get to the sides. But all that happens is it makes it easier for the Romans to cut their way in. The shields banged by the swords to further intimidate the defending Celtic army. And in a minute they'll come forward at the walk. And then the last minute break into a charge. And as you can see, the auxiliaries have all also formed their own little wedge. And the flanks of the formation are protected by the cavalry. Very, very effective, and as I say, still used today by riot police. Here they come. Now, would you stand or would you run? You make your mind up as they come in. Which nearly ended my life. The uh, soldiers will march back, form up, and get on to the next part of the display, which is the firing of the artillery weapons. Used by the Roman army. The Romans were great copyists. If they saw a good idea, 
and they certainly used it for themselves. A lot of their equipment was actually copied from Celtic ideas, and their artillery was developed largely from Greek weapons. Um, the Greeks had taken artillery to a high degree of sophistication, and the Romans continued it. We'll see each weapon shoot, and then I'll describe them in more detail after. First one is a catapulta. It shoots large arrows or bolts. It's an anti-personnel weapon. Next is a ballista. It's a stone thrower. And the third is an onager, which is also a stone thrower. Now each weapon will continue to shoot and I'll give you some general description. We'll look at the onager first of all, the machine which is closest to you. It's a stone thrower. It's got a single arm. It gets its power from the arm passing through a twisted skein of rope, which in ancient times would have been made of sinew or horsehair. The ropes are twisted. They put uh, a strain and a tension. It's a bit like if you put a pencil through a rubber band and twist it around. When you let go, it untwists. It's the same principle here. As the arm is pulled back, a tension is placed on the rope. And releasing it gives the power to shoot the arm forward, which throws the ball into the air. It's a siege weapon. They're not actually trying to hit those targets. What you've got to imagine with the onager is that there's a city or fortress wall in front of you, and they're using the machine to throw the stones high into the air so they'll fall down behind the wall and hit the enemy behind. The centre weapon, the catapulta, is the full size which you would find for a Roman catapulta. You wouldn't make them any bigger, there'd be no need. Each legion would have 60 catapulta, because each century would have its own. And these could all be amassed together to put down a field of fire against the enemy, and also to pick off individual targets. So please, as they're shooting at those targets in the corner, if they miss, just imagine what would happen if there were 60 of them shooting, and the target was made up of thousands of men. You'd hit something every time. These catapulta are quite portable, you can pick it up and carry it. But we also know from sculpture that the Romans mounted, on the, mounted them on small carts which could be drawn into battle by mules and used as sort of a mobile field artillery. The ballista, which is just beheaded a Celt, is also a stone thrower. It looks like a bigger version of the catapulta, and in the way it is. But both of these stone throwers are relatively small by Roman standards. We know from archaeological finds, particularly in the Middle East, that these machines could be made big enough to shoot a stone ball weighing a hundredweight. Now the ballista, having been used so far against the enemy infantry, is going to show you that it can also be used in a siege. So imagine the town wall, and we've got to get the ball over it to hit the enemy behind. There's a very good account of the siege of Jerusalem, which was in the first century AD, where the Romans were using engines like these to throw stones into the besieged city. And we actually know from the Roman writer that the Jewish defenders could see the balls coming and get out of the way. And so the Romans painted them, sort of camouflaged the artillery weapons, not the weapons themselves, but the missiles, so they'd be less easy to pick out against the sky. Just wait while a mosquito goes over. Heading back to its home at Chester. There's one wooden wonder, and of course, there's three other wooden wonders still in front of you. Another shot from each. Oh, wow. Now the next shot, in fact, will split that one in two. <laughs> each of these machines could, in fact, shoot over much longer distances, but even with the limited tension which is on each of them, two absolute of the Emperor. Remember, this is probably the only way they can get to see what the Emperor looks like except on coins. The idea is by saluting 
the image of the emperor. They are, in effect, maintaining their loyalty for him. Very important in the Roman Empire because it was a vast empire and terrifically easy for civil wars to break out. And so if you have maintained your loyalty to the empire, this wasn't likely to happen. So they're going to be saluting the Emperor Vespasianus to close the display. And thereafter, you'll have a chance to cross over the tape barriers and meet the Romans at the moment, if you'd just like to see where you are. Salute their emperor, will you support and salute the Army Street Guard?